beautiful. Thank you. Will the children please come forward? If there are children here who want to come forward. If you don't want to come forward, I'll talk to you from right where you are. You can do that too. <laughs> no pressure. I am really glad you guys are here today. It's okay. It's okay. I know. I know. You know, I'd be doing the same thing. Don't worry. <laughs> Well, listen, today's a special day, and I'm, not, I'm just not talking to just you guys, but everybody here. It's a Memorial Day weekend, so Memorial Day uh, is that day when we remember those of our loved ones who have passed away, particularly those who served in our armed forces in the military, made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, we remember them, uh, especially this weekend. Uh, this weekend, as, as Jill alluded to with the lay reading, is also kind of the unofficial start of summer. Right? So there's going to be a lot of barbecues and cookouts and that sort of thing tomorrow, or today and tomorrow. Uh, so it's an ex exciting time of year that way, too. Um, and I was thinking about that when I was reading and listening to that uh, scripture lesson that jo uh, Jill read about uh, Jesus saying, our faith is like a mustard seed. And I was thinking about how, how many of you put uh, ketchup and mustard on your hot dog or your burger on Memorial Weekend, right? So that was the connection I was trying to make. And I was thinking, well, where does mustard come from, really? Um, and it does come from mustard seeds. And Jesus said our faith is like a mustard seed. So I, I've never seen mustard seeds, so I found some. I found mustard seeds, which I never knew this, but maybe those of you who cook or stuff know about mustard seeds, because it was in the spice section of the store. And these are mustard seeds, which are really, really small. I can, if you want one, I can give you one. If you want a mustard seed, <laughs> they're like, they're like pretty much microscopic. See how small those things are? Just like what you can have one if you want. But uh, they're really, really small. And it's amazing what happens to these seeds because they're so really small. But you plant them in the ground, and they uh, grow a bush. And those, uh, mustard from this little bitty seed, uh, this uh, mustard plant or mustard bush can grow up to be, see how tall they are? Can be like 20 feet wide and 20 feet tall from this little bitty thing. And they, and they flower, these big yellow flowers, and they let those go to seed like these, and then they grind those up and they make mustard out of them. But I don't know if Jesus put mustard on his hot dog or burger on any time, but if they haven't had mustard back then, but I suppose they did. But anyway, uh, he said faith is that small. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Faith shouldn't be that small. Faith should be really, really big. Our belief in God should be really, really big. But he says, no, it's that, that small. And that's important because sometimes you feel small and you feel like, you know what? The world's a really big place and I can't really have much to do with all that goes on in the world because I'm so small. And Jesus says with this story, no, it's okay if you're small. It's okay if you're small. You just need to be small sometimes. And our faith, it's okay if it's small sometimes too. Um, because you only need a little bit of faith in God to make a difference in this world. You only need a little bit of faith, a little bit of trust uh, in God. Because when you have that little bit of faith in God, that little bit of trust in God, then God can do great things in this world through who you are. No matter how big or small you are, God can do big things in the world through you. So it's okay. Don't worry if you look around at the world and you say, geez, there's a lot of crazy things going on, and I don't know if I can do anything about that. Jesus says, mustard seed. Remember the mustard seed. It's so small, but it makes a big difference. All you need is that little bit of trust in God, that little bit of hope, that little bit of love, uh, of God in the world, and great and wonderful things can happen. Great and wonderful things can happen. So, it all starts, too, our faith starts as small as a mustard seed, but to get that going, uh, we'll start with the baptism, because that's a great way to start your journey in faith, in belief in Jesus. And I'm going to see if I can get these back in there, maybe sort of. 
I didn't realize that many were going to come out. Jeez, they're small. So why don't we start there with the, with the uh, baptism this morning, which is a wonderful time of celebration to welcome you and uh, Jack and Evan somewhere um, to, uh, to our faith, to become a believer in Jesus Christ, to become a Christian person. And so we're so excited for that. And it's okay if you start out small. There was a lot of energy going on there, and it was great, because we need energy in the church, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, we welcome uh, the three of them to the community of God's people, the Church Universal. And we're going to pick up on that energy next week, because next week is Pentecost Sunday, the arrival of the Holy Spirit uh, in our tradition. Uh, so we are enc you're encouraged to wear red, which is the color, liturgical color of the day. So if you've got a red shirt, a red tie, something uh, to wear next week uh, that's red, that'd be great. Uh, next Sunday is also Communion Sunday, which means it is uh, Food Pantry Sunday. So this week, if you're shopping around, want to pick up some, some uh, canned goods or other things that uh, the uh, pantry, uh, the two pantries here in Melrose might uh, uh, take advantage of, that would be great. You can just bring them to church next Sunday, and we'll have uh, bins set up to, to put those in. Also next Sunday, after the worship service, is our spring congregational meeting. Uh, at that meeting, we read the uh, warrant last uh, Sunday for that. Uh, here in church, and um, the main features of that meeting are approval of the annual report of the church, a copy of which will be available as a hard copy next week, but in the meantime, it's online, and there's a link right here in the, in the uh, bulletin uh, on the back page to, uh, uh, to link up to the, the reports as they come in, uh, so that you can uh, be informed in your voting on that report. The other feature, of course, is the slate of officers, which will also be presented at that meeting. Right now, uh, just a reminder that we and our church continue to take our offering in a contactless way. So there are offering plates at the exits of each, uh, each door here. Uh, and we hope that you'll uh, be uh, moved to make a contribution to our church uh, that will help us to uh, continue to build up the ministries of Christ in this place. Uh, that I always say that uh, your offering isn't just about the money, it's a tangible expression of your faith. It's a way of uh, allowing this church to spread the light and hope and justice and peace of God into the wider world uh, through the ministries we undertake here. So as we sing the uh, doxology uh, uh, this morning, uh, contemplate your giving, and uh, we do thank you for that in the spirit of Christ. Your offering is invited. There's a powerful story in the book of Acts that I want to share with you this morning about Paul and Silence is found in the 16th chapter, and it reads like this. <clears throat> One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaimed to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had, after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into a prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. 
the jailer called for lights. And rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. There ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. And will you pray with me? Compassionate creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts Bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if baptism is the beginning of one's journey into the Christian faith, this scripture lesson is an example of that faith coming up against the hard reality of this world. It's a strange story, really. Paul and Silas find themselves in jail. But how they got in jail is the strange part. Paul and Silas were on a mission trip to the city of Philippi. That's where this all takes place. And they are teaching and they're preaching about Jesus, introducing the Christian faith to people who have no idea what it is. And they're out there doing this, traveling around the city day after day, when they notice that they're being followed. And they're being followed by a young girl who shouts to everybody who's around them, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Now, you'd think that'd be a good thing, kind of like having a cheerleader on your side everywhere you go, but Paul doesn't think so. Maybe, I don't know, maybe because she wouldn't let up. She kept doing this day after day after day. And Anyway, he gets pretty annoyed. He gets pretty annoyed with this girl, and so he calls out the spirit that's in her. A little unclear what that means exactly. Again, you'd think in the context of scripture that'd be a good thing, maybe a subtle way of telling her to take it down a notch, but not so much. It doesn't work at all, really. That's because the young girl is someone who's a kind of fortune teller, sent out by others to make money. And now they've lost their income thanks to Paul and his off-the-cuff exorcism. So they drag Paul and Silas to the marketplace and make false accusations against them before the local magistrates. And it all goes downhill from there. The magistrates order that Paul and Silas be stripped and beaten with rods, which they were. And after their beating, they are thrown into the innermost cell, <coughs> excuse me, the darkest part of a prison. So try and get a handle on that. Suppose you're on a mission trip somewhere, some foreign country, a foreign city, and you're falsely accused of a crime. And you're attacked by a violent mob. You're stripped and beaten and thrown into a dark prison cell. Now I don't think there are very many of us who could endure that kind of violence, that kind of injustice. But really, this is an extreme example of what all of us have experienced or will experience at one time in our lives, and that's this, the loss of everything we know. The loss of everything that is important to us, the loss of everything that's secure. There are times in all of our lives when we feel trapped, when we feel alone, when we know help is not coming. In those moments, how do you respond? That's an important question because how you answer that, how you do respond, reveals what you really believe in, what you really value. So how did Paul and Silas respond? Well, they could have fallen silent and gone into a deep depression. They 
could have given up. They could have just lost all hope and cried. That would have been very understandable. Instead, they sing. They sing. And they pray. Think about that. In their weakest, weakest moment, they sing. And they pray. Now, what do you suppose they were singing about? What do you suppose they were praying about? To be rescued? Maybe. Or were they singing about and praying about God's goodness? I suspect it was that. I suspect it's the latter. And in that, when everything else about them was stripped away and lost, they showed who it was that they truly believed in and what it was that they truly valued. I don't believe they were playing, praying for rescue because God's not so much in that business. God would have done that in the marketplace long before they ended up in prison. I believe they prayed in gratitude. In gratitude for the very presence of God. The very presence of God in their lives that had brought them purpose. And in that they found their freedom. Because you see, Here's the truth of the matter. If you truly believe, as I hope Jack and Callie and Evan will, if you truly believe that God sets you free, then there is nothing in this life that can ever truly imprison you. And here's the thing. When you live from that place, it doesn't go unnoticed. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners, prisoners were listening to them. Listening to them. People listen. People notice. The way you are, the faith that you have, the way you live is contagious. I mean, not in a way that COVID-19 or, or bird flu or monkeypox or God knows what else is coming down the pike is contagious, but I mean people notice. People notice. It impacts them. When they see a tiny flame of hope and gratitude in you, especially when your world is coming apart, it matters. When you display faith, even as small as that mustard seed, it matters. When others see that your life is not consumed by your present problems, but by your trust in God, it matters. And remember, faithfulness doesn't have to be showy. In fact, it shouldn't be showy. It's the small things. It's listening to someone who's hurt. It's praying. It's singing. It's, it's being honest in the struggle. Being honest in the struggle. Because in the end, it comes down to this. Of course we are to work for good. Of course we're to, to uh, work to make this world a better place through our faith. But really, in the end, it isn't about your ability to make things better. It's about your trust that things will get better. Hear that again. Faith is not about your ability to make things better. It's about your trust that things will get better. And that trust is not automatic. I get that. In the hardest of times, it's hard to trust that things are going to get better. But even in those times, even in those times, sing and pray. Even if what you sing and pray is a lament. Because that's honest. I'm not judging, but when a, when a, when a person's life is crumbling around them and they go around with a smile on their face and say, I got Jesus, so it's all good, that's not exactly an inspiration. And I wonder if it's authentic. I think the most powerful examples of faith come from our inadequacy. From our inadequacy. When you confess, your confession that you are not adequate to this moment, your confession that you are helpless, that's not only honest, but it's affirming to other people. It brings light and hope and life to others who are in that same prison with you. And in that, there is a pathway 
to freedom from that prison. Not only for you, but for others who are there with you. Because remember, it wasn't just Paul and Silas who were liberated from that jail. All the other prisoners, as well as the guard of the jail, were as well. The doors broke open, the shackles fell away. A tsunami of liberation was unleashed. And it's still washing over us today in the waters of baptism. So today, my prayer is that you'll remember this story. Remember this story and try to trust God just a little bit more in your weakest moments. I pray that in those moments you will sing and you will pray, not asking God for anything, but just to be in God's presence. And I pray that you know you know the example of healing and goodness that you set by your honest inadequacy to those who are listening because it matters. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray to you in thanksgiving for the many blessings in our lives and for the beauty of this world. And may we also, in the worst and weakest moments of our lives, sing and pray like Paul and Silas, so that we may simply be near you in our honesty of faith. We know that doors will open and chains will fall, for you are a God of liberation who always desires our healing and our renewal. Bless our church as we continue to live and work in the spirit of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.